Okay, folks, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of the BPPV. Uh, we have two very exciting talks today. Uh, the first one is by Arvind Rao Karanam, who's going to tell us about eukaryotic chemo chemotaxis under periodic stimulus. So, Arvind, take it away. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Arvind. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at uh, at Rochester Institute of Technology uh, and at the uh, like, like supervision of Dr. Momita Das. And today I'm going to talk about the work I did in my PhD uh, at, at UC San Diego. Uh, it is about eukaryotic chemotaxis. Um, so let's get started. Uh, I'll, I'll start by introducing what chemotaxis is. So it is the directed motion of cells uh, in response to chemical signals. So a lot of, like many kinds of cells exhibit chemotaxis. Uh, here we are studying the chemotaxis by eukaryotic cells. So like this is a, like a simple diagram to show you the direction of motion in which a eukaryotic cell like would be moving. Like generally there, there are chemoattractants. So these are chemicals that the cell is attracted to and then uh, they move along the gradient of the chemoattractant, right? And we study this because it occurs in a like in a wide variety of uh, of contexts in biology, it is critical for wound healing in tissues, and it is also seen in cancer metastasis and so on. So, to give you some like flavor of this phenomenon, here are some videos showing chemotaxis. Uh, like firstly, in a bloodstream, when a wound has been artificially created uh, on the skin of a fish. And, and the stream you see at the bottom is the bloodstream and some cells, like namely neutrophils, are moving away from the bloodstream and towards, oops, give me a second. Yeah, and towards the wound site, right? So there are cells you can follow here. So, and this happens through chemotaxis because there is an infection and these cells are attracted to uh, like the bacteria or like whichever organisms are causing that infection, right? And a second example here would be uh, the spreading or metastasis of cancer uh, in a mouse model in this case. So here again is a bloodstream and these tumor cells are moving away from the tumor and into the bloodstream. And this also happens through chemotaxis, right? Um, specifically here, uh, the model organism that we are studying is, is called Dictyostelium discordium. Uh, it is a eukaryotic cell. Uh, its size is about like 10 microns, which is typical of, of eukaryotic cells. Uh, and it is attracted to a small molecule called cyclic AMP. Uh, and I'm going to interchange the chemoattractant and cyclic AMP, so it might be helpful to remember the name. And, and this is a, like a clear and small uh, like video showing you how the chemotaxis is seen. So, we have a micropipette in here, uh, like where the cyclic AMP is being deposited at various points uh, in this frame. And the cell promptly like, goes to the source every time, right? And, and this being a eukaryotic cell, it is uh, like, it's, like it's quite easy for the cell to change its shape and, uh, and it can change like symmetrically in all directions. And uh, like there are receptors on, on its surface um, like spread uniformly all over, right? So, and this cell is attracted to cyclic AMP and it is, and it also happens in a particular context in its life cycle, namely, uh, it happens during the aggregation phase of the life cycle of dictyostelium. So, right, so here is a, a cartoon of how a life cycle of this organism like would go in a laboratory, for example, because all the times here are done for a laboratory experiment. So initially, the cell uh, is isolated; it lives independently. But when it is uh, starved, like when it has run out of food, a number of cells in the population do aggregate, and this aggregation happens through uh, like signaling each other through this chemical, this cyclic AMP, right? And and once they aggregate, uh, it becomes a multicellular structure, and and that can differentiate into a fruiting body and a stalk, and then uh, at the end of the cycle, some cells are like formed into spores, and then they are like dispersed uh, into some place where preferably there is food. And then these sperms will germinate, and then the cycle starts all over again. Right? And we are interested in this particular phase of the life cycle of dictyostelium. 
right? Uh, and to show you how aggregation would look like, here's a laboratory experiment wherein a number of cells are plated on a cell, uh, on a, like on a surface. Uh, so, and then like, like it is observed, like, like, like there's no other like manipulation being done here. So if you wait for about five to six hours, these waves of cyclic AMP start appearing, right? And what you see on the left is what you would observe under a microscope. But uh, like the frame here is just a processed image. So like you take like the difference of two successive images and you see these very high contrast waves spreading through the population, right? Um, so if you wait like for a few seconds here, we see that initially there are several sources of this particularly AMP waves. And eventually there will be like one wave like, through which uh, like, like all the waves are emanating from and these cells would eventually aggregate to that center, right? So waves is how these uh, cells uh, like sense the cyclic AMP and that is how they, like, like this, like the primary stimulus through which they uh, exhibit chemotaxis, right? So like during aggregation, every cell is facing like multiple waves of chemoattractant. And that uh, like brought the question to us, uh, like we were interested in seeing, you know, how uh, like a single cell, for example, would um, have its like have its chemotaxis behavior develop over like, over multiple waves because every cell faces like multiple uh, waves of cyclic AMP. So is the chemotactic uh, efficiency somehow affected by these like multiple waves? Is the question we asked. So before I tell that, uh, yeah, so. Like this is the question. Uh, I will primarily focus on the first question here today. If you have time, I might go into the second one. So the first question is, you know, every cell uh, encounters like multiple waves, which are identical and, and coming from the same direction. Uh, is the chemotaxis affected by exposure to multiple identical waves, right? And the second one is, uh, as they are aggregating, like the density is also increasing. So like, like the, uh, so does the density of cells or equivalently, is the concentration of the background cyclic AMP affect the chemotactic behavior of the cells? Right. So, like before, I tell you like what we did uh, in this experiment. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you a brief like background on uh, on some of the work like that was done in our group uh, a little while ago. Right. So this is to study cyclic AMP signaling through waves. So the waves we saw are occurring naturally. So like we wanted to have like more control on how these are generated and how quickly they're moving and so on. So we made a microfluidic device in our lab, like with the help of our collaborators. So like here's a schematic of the microfluidic device. Uh, it has the central chamber, like through which the chemoattractant wave is made to move from right to left uh, at a particular speed, like which can be tuned uh, like by these buffer solutions. Right, and in the center of this blue chamber is where we like, is where we plate our cells, and we observe them under a microscope. Right, and the speed with which this can move uh, is again like tunable. Right, and when we do that, like when we set the wave speed to, uh, or equivalently, the period of the wave to like six minutes we see and, and we notice the movement of the cells and then we track them and then we plot the displacement of the cells as a function of time. Uh, here is what we observe, right? Like this is the average displacement of the population as a function of the chemoattractant concentration as a function of time. So like we see that initially when the concentration is rising, uh, the cells exhibit a positive displacement. So they are moving like to the right. So uh, if you see a positive displacement, it means that the cells are moving to the right, okay? So like this is not surprising because like one might think that the cells are following the gradient, which is, so in the first half, there is a positive gradient. So the cells are attracted to it and then they move to the right. But what is surprising is in the second half of the wave where the concentration is actually like decreasing, the cells continue to move to the right. So if you th if you just assume that a cell is um, like following the local gradient, it should move front or it should move to the right in the first half of the wave. 
and it should move back or to the left in the second half of the wave. Essentially, it should be oscillating, but that is clearly not is what's happening here, right? So cells do not oscillate. In fact, they do not just, um, you know, stay like where they are in the back half of the wave. Uh, if they are just integrating the response, uh, then the integral would saturate, say at this point, and then the displacement would be constant. Like there's no more displacement in the back half of the wave. That is also not what we see, right? So there's something more than just like rectification of um, of the response, right? So, and we can be a, a, like a bit more quantitative about this. So we define a quantity known as chemotactic index, CI for short, which is basically uh, a measure of the orientation of the cells. So here we divide the displacement of the cells, which can be positive or negative, by the total path length that they take, uh, which is always positive, right? So this number is between minus one and plus one. And a positive chemotactic index tells us that a cell is moving to the right, whereas a negative one sh shows that, uh, tells us that it's moving to the left. Uh, and so like for this particular period, which is six minutes, we see only positive CIs, right? So right, so how can we understand this through a model, right? So this is a model like which has been uh, like used in the field like, like for many years now. Uh, it's called local excitation and global inhibition and with memory. Like the memory part is what we are focusing on here. But I'll start with like describing the local excitation and global inhibition model itself. It's called LEGI for short. Um, here we model a cell as a one-dimensional system with the front and a back. And then the wave is moving from the right to the left, right? And then the model starts with uh, the concentration of cyclic AMP, which is the chemoattractant, activating the receptors, right? And then an activated receptor further activates two things, uh, an excitator and an inhibitor, right? So excitator is the E and inhibitor is I. And they are called so because the excitator excites the response element S and the inhibitor inhibits this. Um, like they're not uh, identical, right? So the excitation is local and the inhibition is global. Like what happens as a result is initially, like the excitation is stronger than the inhibition. So we see a spike in the response and eventually it will it'll die down. So, and, and then you're back to the baseline. So having this small difference of having excitation locally, but inhibition globally, uh, like does give us uh, a spike in the, like in the response element. Like this, if we, if we apply just this to the wave experiment that we saw a slide ago, uh, like we would still not see the memory. Uh, it would just be that on the back half of the wave, the cell does not move at all. It, it's like rectification. But to add to this model, we, we introduce a new memory um, module. And then the memory is related to the response element like through these bistable dynamics, right? So the memory can be between zero and one, and how and where it switches is dependent on the levels of uh, the S, right? And you can translate everything into equations and uh, and here's how they are. Uh, like a couple of remarks on the set of equations here. So like we see the subscript F everywhere. Uh, it means that these equations are for the front of the cell and there is an equivalent set for the back half of the cell, uh, except for I where is, you know, uh, inhibit, the inhibitor I is global. So it has only one value on both the front and the back of the cell. Uh, and the second point I want to make is that this, uh, like, uh, so like these terms here indicate that there is a switch-like behavior. It's called uh, zeroth order ultrasensitivity. Uh, if you want to, like, if you have to like use the jargon, like, like it just shows that the response, uh, can be like quite dramatic. Uh, it, it can act like a switch. And this is important for cells because they are able to uh, like reliably sense like very shallow gradients. So the response of, uh, like the effect of E on S is through this ultrasensitive response. And likewise, the effect on I on S is also ultrasensitive, right? And how does this work? Uh, like, so that's what like we're going to see next. and. And this model like, can be related to 
the chemotactic index, which we defined earlier as, you know, uh, as just being a linear combination of the difference in M between front and the back and the difference in S in the front and the back. Okay. So, and this can be also related to uh, actual like biochemical components in the cell. So that the signaling component S or the response uh, is seen to be uh, like similar to the response of RAS GTP, which is a molecular switch in the cell, which can activate actin polymerization in, and lead to the formation of pseudopodia and ultimately the displacement of cells. Right? And I'm going to show you how this model like behaves if we have two different wave periods. Earlier we saw that uh, like we saw the response of the cells to a six minute wave period. And so like uh, here we see that there is a significant response of the memory and the response only on the front half of the cell. Uh, like this is because um, like there, uh, so it happens because uh, like because there's a small time gap between the wave going from the front uh, to the back, and that like time scale also matches the gap between uh, the activation time scales of E and I. So as a result, on the back half of the cell, um, the excitator and inhibitor do cancel out each other, and so there is no response. Like whereas in the front. Uh, the excitator is earlier and so stronger than the inhibitor. So there is a significant response in the front. But if we make the wave period too large, um, you have enough time for the inhibitor to die down on the back half of the wave. And so the excitator can like once again excite. And so like we see the response of both S and M on both the back and the front. So the upshot of all that is you can have chemotactic index, which is negative, if the period is too large, right? For the, and for a short period, like for anywhere between six to 10 minutes, we have a situation where CI is positive throughout. Okay, so, and these are simulation results and these are experimental, experimentally plotted uh, CI. So, and they do agree well with each other. So like so far, like we have seen that there is this leggy model, which is called local excitation and global inhibition. And that is coupled to a memory module. And this predicts well the um, of the directional memory of cells when the period is not too large, like when the period of the wave is between six and 10 minutes, right? So now let's address this question, uh, which is that a cell faces like multiple waves, like presumably of uh, identical periods. Uh, so does facing multiple identical waves have an effect on the chemotactic ability of the cell? So to address this question, we once again went back to the microfluidic device we had uh, in our lab. And this is uh, a sample movie of uh, actual cells plated on a, on a surface. And then we see in red, um, the, uh, like we see the cyclic AMP wave like moving from right to left, right? And again, like the period of the wave is, is tunable. So we took like two regimes in which like, like in the first case, the period is about six minutes, and so and so we call it fast. In the second case, the period is uh, large, it's between fifteen and twenty minutes, and we call it slow regime. Right, and and for simplicity, we restricted the cells to move in one dimension here, and so like we see the cells only move to the right or the left. This is done by coating the glass surface with a polymer like PDMS. Uh, these cells do not prefer to move on the polymer. They prefer to move on glass. So then essentially like we are making tracks for them to like crawl on, right? So, and that causes uh, like the one dimensional chemotaxis we notice. And we also check that like, like creating these channels does not inhibit their chemotactic ability. So if we make them a little wider, uh, so the response we see here is essentially similar to having just only a glass surface, right? Uh, so like, like this simplification helps us, but it is not like changing the system in any significant way. Uh, and once again, after, after tracking the cells, we again compute the chemotactic index uh, for all the cells. And, uh, and now I'm gonna show you how this quantity will vary with uh, as the cells face like multiple cycles. Okay, so 
the effect of encountering several waves on CI is as follows. So let's take one period in the slow regime, uh, sorry, like, like in the fast regime for six minutes and one period in the slow regime for 15 minutes. So, and if you see uh, across cycles, we see that the chemotactic index is slowly increasing in its average value, right? So, so, so the cycle one shown in blue uh, is at this level. And as the cells see multiple cycles, the population, so uh, here is the average over all the population, right? So the population CI is increasing. Uh, and this is for the fast wave, uh, like for the six minute range. But if the if the wave period is slow, and we essentially see like no like difference across cycles, right? And and we can also plot the average CI like for the entire cycle as one number, and and see how that varies across cycles, right? So, uh, and once again shown in blue is the six minute period, and in orange is the fifteen minute period, and the twenty minute looks similar, right? So. How do we understand this? So we see that there is a periodic buildup of something like which causes the CI to increase over multiple cycles. And this is seen uh, only in the short period. And this is not seen in the long period, right? So there is a period dependence on the growth of CI uh, and what causes it. So the model we had so far, which is the local excitation, global inhibition, plus a memory module, uh, is not fit like to explain this because all the components in this model uh, do like reset at the end of the wave. So they start at zero and they end up at zero after the cycle. So like there should not be uh, like a gradual buildup of anything over multiple cycles. So like, so then this, like we thought that the model uh, like need to be revised and extended. And so we introduced a new component, which we call X, and it should be time dependent, right? Because the growth is seen only for shorter periods, but not for the longer periods. And so we introduce this new component. So how does this X like like depend or affect the other uh, components in the in the model, right? So this is what we have so far, and we have a new component X. So how are these nodes like affected or affected by X, right? So like to show you like one like time series of either R, E, and I, because all of them look like more or less identical. We see that for the short period, for the six minutes, it goes from zero to the amplitude and back to zero in about six minutes, like not surprising. But what's interesting here is, I know, um, it happens faster, like whereas, this, like, like, like whereas for the longer periods, the growth is slower, right? So if you make the growth of X dependent on the rate of growth instead of, you know, like the absolute concentration, then we see the stronger activation of X for the shorter period. So the X has to be activated in such a way that it is activated faster, uh, like when, so it is activated stronger if the, if the wave period is fast, as opposed to the wave period being slow, but being on for a longer duration. So if instead of plotting the absolute concentration of R, if we plotted the time derivative of these things, we see that there is a higher time derivative for the short period uh, and a lower time derivative for the long period. Right? So if you make the uh, activity or the activation of X like dependent on the time derivative instead of the absolute concentration, then we get like what we are after, right? So, and we took the simplest possible case of uh, having a cutoff and a switch-like transition, and and uh, and we see that like using a sigmoidal function, and we also needed the activation of uh, uh, like here like we also needed the presence of m like to make it uh, asymmetric, right? So as in the x like should be active only on the front but not on the back. So like these two considerations like made us like choose this form for x as in you have a memory like which activates the buildup of X and and that buildup happens through a time derivative of of the receptor right and then like and then we then extend the definition of CI to include X as well. Arvind, you have about two minutes more okay I'm I'm almost done. So here we have the definition of uh, CI from model right How does this 
compare against the experimental results, right? So here's what the uh, like the theory prediction of CI looks like. So it increases over like several cycles, whereas for the longer periods, for 15 and 20 minutes, there's essentially like no growth in the chemotactic ability, like in the CI, right? So like we can understand this as follows. Uh, for the shorter period, uh, so M is active only at the front, but its time derivative is high. So there is a buildup of X over several cycles. But if you have a longer period, uh, then sure, then M is active both at the front and the back, but uh, the time derivative is not big enough to cause any activation in X. And if you compare both the experimental values and the theory uh, like predictions, we see that it agrees pretty well. Okay. So I'm going to end with like some like remarks on how this is actually like relevant in the uh, like in the aggregation behavior of dictostelium. So uh, like to like to summarize like like what we saw, we saw that there is a periodic like buildup of CI over several cycles, and this happens for the short period and not the long period. And uh, like if you look at the aggregation movie once again, like which is where we started. Initially, like there are like several spots where like waves come from, but eventually like there's one center. And for every cell, like there are multiple waves like which are coming from the same direction, right? So seeing multiple waves from the same direction is a signal that the cell uh, like needs to go to that center as opposed to earlier like where they are coming from everywhere and there's no defined center of aggregation, right? And as you can see, uh, all the cells are coming and then the light, and, the, and then the life cycle will uh, like will proceed, right? And in the end, I want to thank the people who have helped me uh, in this project. First of all, my advisor, Dr. Um, like Walter Jan Rappel, and also the uh, also my collaborators in the group, Dr. Uh, like Richard Karmaker and Dr. Mano Tang. I also want to thank my department and the QBio program at UCSD, like where I was a part of, and and the work I like I just described is in these papers if you want to take a look, but I'm also happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erwin. That was that was really fascinating. Uh, so just thanking you uh, and, you know, applauding on behalf of the audience. Uh, folks, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, let me just get started while people are thinking about it. We have time for a few questions. So, um, uh, you know, your your models are really interesting and very 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 fascinating. But of course, you know this is a question you must be getting very often. Like, uh, what's the correspondence between sort of the phenological model and what we know about uh, cyclic AMP signaling in dictyostelium? Uh, so, in, in other words, have people figured out the like you 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 gave us the possible identity of one component, mm -hmm. right? Which yes. It has, but what would X be, for example, uh, in your yeah. Model. Yeah, so like people have identified, you know, uh, the receptor is there, of course. The, so S uh, here is the uh, the RAS GTP, and these are the kinase and uh, like the kinases and phosphatases. But still, um, like we're still not sure what M and X would be like, like molecularly, like like what would um, be uh, like uh, you know uh, like the biochemical counterpart. Pe like people are still trying to find it, but uh, we have enough uh, evidence, like like phenomenologically, that there has to be something which is building up in the model uh, and it is dependent on period and so on. Uh, I don't think uh, we know like the identity of these things. So X itself is intriguing, right? Because uh, yeah. uh, you're saying that X should be proportional to uh, to the time derivative of R which yeah. means that it should be basically proportional to time derivative of cyclic AMP. Yes. yes. Right? Because the two are sort of really related to each other. So uh, do you have thoughts about what, uh, uh, you know, what signaling system could achieve that? Because, uh, I mean, clearly you need some information processing to produce X. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, like it in dictostelium, like, like uh, it's not clear at the moment, but there are other systems, uh, other mammalian cell systems, where they have reported a uh, like a time dependent or like a temporal gradient, uh, mm -hmm. like sensing mechanism. So, uh, like I'd want to look into that and and see if there is a similar, uh, like network in in dictostelium as well. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.